and thank you for joining today's Annex 4 Environment Research Webinar Series. Please note that all participant lines will be muted for the duration of the call. You are welcome to submit written questions during the presentation, and these will be addressed during Q&A. To send a note, use the notes function on the lower right-hand side of your screen and address your note to all moderators. With that, I'll turn the call over to Simon Gearlaw, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, Marine Sciences Laboratory. Please go ahead. Thank you, Marvin, and thank you all for joining us here this morning. Um, as Marvin mentioned, this is the, the Annex 4 Environmental Research Webinar Series, and this is actually the 14th webinar in that series. We have a great panel today. Um, if you're joining us for the first time in this series, I will conclude our presentation today with a slide that provides more information on Annex 4 and how you can access this webinar as well as other webinars in the series, so please stay tuned for that. The title of today's webinar is Information Collection and Consenting Processes for Wave and Tidal Deployments, Lessons from the Field. And we have two panelists today that will discuss their own lessons learned um, from both their perspective of wave power and tidal energy. The connecting thread between these two presentations is real-world lessons learned, how places are moving forward to address regulatory, environmental, and social concerns associated with this, uh, these emerging set of energy technologies. So I'd like to welcome both speakers now. I will briefly introduce them. I'll mention their names, uh, and then we will introduce them in more detail as they present. Uh, so what I'll be doing also, just a quick programming note, is rather than taking questions from you after each presentation, we'll let both presenters speak, and then we'll do uh, a discussion at the end. And as Marvin mentioned, please do send us your questions. If you don't have questions, then we'll work internally to get a discussion going, but your participation is much, much welcomed. So our two speakers today, and Marvin, maybe go ahead and switch to the next slide, please. Our two speakers today are Shelley McDougall, who will be going first. Shelley, uh, Dr. McDougall is a professor emeritus at Acadia University in Canada. She'll be speaking about tidal energy in the Bay of Fundy. And our second presenter will be Jan Sundberg. Uh, Dr. Sundberg is a professor at the Department of Engineering Sciences uh, in Uppsala University in Sweden. So as I mentioned, I will introduce them both more fully, and I'll start by introducing Dr. McDougall. So next slide, please. Dr. McDougall was born and raised in Nova Scotia. She earned a Bachelor of Commerce degree from St. Mary's University and an MBA from Dalhousie uh, and did her PhD work at Bradford University in England. She taught corporate finance at Acadia University from 1987 until 2016 and co-owned EEP Engineered and Environmental Products, Inc. Dr. McDougall's area of research is strategic capital investments and uh, in new technology. She is a founding member of the Acadia Tidal Energy Institute and is presently conducting research on the development of tidal energy in the Bay of Fundy. She wrote Funding and Financial Supports for Tidal Energy Development in Nova Scotia and co-wrote the Value Proposition for Tidal Energy Development in Nova Scotia, Atlantic, Canada, and Canada in 2015. She was also co-project lead and editor of the Community and Business Toolkit for Tidal Energy Development and authored its first financial modules. Dr. McDougall has published research in international scholarly journals, International Journal of Marine Energy, Energy Policy, Omega International, Journal of Management Science, the Journal of Enterprise and Communities, the Journal of Small Business and Entrepreneurship, the International Journal of Knowledge, Culture, and Change Management, and the Journal of Intellectual Capital. So thank you, Dr. McDougall, for joining us today. We look forward to your presentation and to the discussion following Jan's presentation. So go ahead, take it away. Thank you very much, Simon, and good day, everyone. Uh, I am going to be uh, speaking about uh, socioeconomic um, data collected uh, as opposed to environmental data collected. We've done a lot of environmental data collection in Nova Scotia, and I'm excluding that only because um, socioeconomic uh, issues are, are, my, uh, in, are in my bailiwick. So, um, I guess uh, what I'd like to uh, do is uh, go to the next slide, Marvin, and, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we've done. Oh, next slide. One more. 
Right. Thank you very much. Um, so these are the uh, steps that have been taken in Nova Scotia with regard to social and economic uh, measurements and um, consultations and studies. And then uh, the, the, the left column is consultations and, and studies um, on socioeconomic um, factors. And on the right column is the government initi initiatives that happened within that time frame. So, I'll just go down this a little bit because it's it's kind of relevant the uh, the the order in which things took place. Um, back in 2008, Nova Scotia began to realize that it had an, an opportunity with the uh, Bay of Fundy tides to harness some of the energy to develop not only uh, renewable energy source of renewable energy, but uh, to develop a new technology that might have a market. Um, around the world, and we have a very strong uh, ocean tech sector here in Nova Scotia, particularly Halifax, and uh, marine economy, and so uh, it seemed very fitting to explore this. So they did a strategic uh, environmental assessment. Uh, they had that, the province uh, had that done, and that was the first of two. Uh, and uh, it, that involved a lot of consultation with, uh, with people in Nova Scotia, as many of you know the, the process for that. In 2009, we, uh, the province uh, had a, a Mi'kmaq uh, ecological uh, knowledge study performed, and that is uh, also called MEX, M-E-K-S. And uh, the Mi'kmaq are the uh, indigenous peoples of Nova Scotia, and they have a lot of traditional knowledge about the area, land and water here. And so this is part of the consultation process absolutely required by the province, but also important to gather their insights uh, as to what we don't know about the waters and the land in around the Bay of Fundy. Um, we also had at that time a Nova Scotia Renewable Energy Strategy consultation. And you'll see the arrows in my table point down to where the consultation led to the development of the Nova Scotia Marine Renewable Energy Strategy. Uh, later on in 2012. Um, during this time, Fundy Ocean Research Center for Energy was established uh, near our uh, fastest water and in the Minus Passage, and it included a community li liaison committee, which uh, which would reach out to the community and is still is still in action. Um, in 2010, uh, marine renewable legislation consultation was conducted. And in 2010, the Nova Scotia Renewable Energy Plan, the, uh, basically the, uh, the um, <clears throat> targets, the demand of the targets for re renewable energy in, in our mix was uh, established there, and a feed-in feed tariff program was announced. Um, in 2011, we conducted uh, an infrastructure study, uh, mostly around the Bay of Sunny, but around all of the province, to see where the infrastructure uh, we needed was uh, where it was, what was missing, and so as to, to plan uh, development of infrastructure. And the community feed and tariff was announced that year as well, and five community feed and tariffs were awarded. Now, community feed and tariff is for small scale tidal uh, devices uh, under 0.5 megawatts, and uh, the, the benefit goes to the local community, and the energy is delivered to the uh, system as opposed to transmission grid. Uh, in 2012, uh, a second Mi'kmaq ecological knowledge study was conducted in a different part of the Bay of Fundy, and, uh, and that completed the, uh, the analysis needed for that body of water. Um, and the scoping study was done uh, on the socioeconomic impacts on, uh, of tidal energy. Now, all of these involved uh, consultations with members of the community, various stakeholders. And uh, then uh, the Marine Renewable Strategy was released, and uh, the Fundy FAST program, uh, Fundy Advanced Sensor Technology Program, which I'll mention later if I have time, um, was announced. 2013, the um, Business and Community Toolkit for Tidal Energy Development was written. I was a part of that. We had a lot of uh, experts uh, write in modules. Uh, on uh, pretty well everything you would ever want to know about tidal energy, but we're afraid to ask. And we consulted with the communities on that and also uh, give us feedback on it. And uh, that it was really there to empower stakeholders, community members, concern groups to know what, the, what processes had to be followed for businesses to develop 
um, tidal energy and how the, the supply chain can benefit, how communities can benefit, and so on. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, we also did a, a community engagement handbook. And uh, on the government initiative side, uh, the uh, development arrays for large scale um, uh, devices, so seed and tariff was announced for that, and a subsea data cable was installed at Forest. In 2014, we updated the strategic uh, environmental assessment, and uh, the uh, developmental seed and tariff array, uh, array seed and tariffs were awarded to uh, four birth holders at Forest and the subsea power cable was installed. Uh, in 2015, we did a, um, an economic impact analysis, the value proposition, and I was involved in that. And also, uh, in Nova Scotia uh, announced its electricity plan from, for the period 2015 to 2040. And in 2016, uh, we had an infrastructure study uh, updated um, and, to, uh, and also in 2016, and the results are still being uh, uh, haven't been released yet, uh, a, an uh, MRE, Marine Renewable Energy Area Study, basically analyzing where in the Bay of Fundy commercial development could occur in terms of where is there a resource that would be suitable for commercial development. Um, and uh, what has been cut off the bottom of my slide, sorry about that, is uh, funding and financial support study, uh, how uh, it's kind of a scoping study of how funding and financial supports by governments is done uh, around the world and how Nova Scotia could apply it here. And in 2016 as well, the Nova Scotia Marine Renewable Energy Act, uh, which is the legislative framework, has, um, was announced. And that's pretty well where we are right now. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Marvin, are you able to move to the next slide? Yes, there is a bit of a delay. Okay. So just a, a moment on the value proposition. We, uh, we found that we did a number of scenarios on it, um, just a development um, uh, array and then uh, commercial arrays of three to 500 um, megawatts in the minus passage. And, and under an early adopter 300 megawatt scenario, we estimated there would be 22,000 new full-time equivalent jobs. Uh, 1.1 billion in uh, additional labor income and 1.7 billion in additional GDP. Now, for a province that has 945,000 people, that's a pretty, that's a pretty large, those are pretty handsome numbers. Uh, export potential uh, depends on the estimate of the global industry, but uh, I, you can see on my slide uh, several estimates uh, for 2024 and 2015, and these. Different, different estimates uh, come about as we realize the, the development potential and, and the setbacks that we've that we experienced. Emissions avoided, um, 9.6 million tons of CO2. And the box on the right shows the various good services and participants that, that could benefit. It involves not only the trades, but also knowledge, uh, knowledge workers, um, advanced uh, uh, um, jo jobs for people with university and, and technical college um, education. So there's a wide variety of, of jobs that, that would be available as a result of developing tidal energy in Nova Scotia. Next slide, please. The other benefits and costs that we were we didn't really we weren't able to measure um, are um, the value of um, the rural industrial diversification. Our fastest water we don't tend to build our our biggest uh, communities on our fast water. You tend to build them in a harbor where there's quiet water, and uh, so uh, the areas near the Bay of Fundy's fast water. Um, are, uh, are, are, are very uh, rural and coastal, uh, small towns and, uh, and communities. And, and so this uh, would provide an opportunity for uh, industrial diversification uh, in those small communities. And, and not just the trades, but new economy jobs. Now, it, recognizing that those are good things, there's also displacement that's likely. For instance, some fishers may lose access to some parts of their fishing 
grounds, and, and, uh, and there's always a question as to whether one job, a person might lose their job because they're not in the appropriate trade or new economy job, and uh, that displacement needs to be recognized. Um, I, don't, I don't believe that one job is more important than another. I think they're all good, and, but, uh, but we have to acknowledge that the place, displacement uh, is likely, and at the, at the personal level, that can be very difficult for, uh, for people. Um, it also requires sharing uh, the marine space and its resources, and this is something that's a bit new to us uh, in terms of bringing in tidal energy to a really pristine uh, body of water and, um, and one that has very much been about fishing and, uh, and the, the uh, flora and fauna that live within it. Um, then, um, the, so the traditional industries will likely be affected, and the, the value proposition estimated the gross benefit, but not the net uh, benefit, the benefit net of losses to other industries. And there is a cost of, in terms of high cost of energy, and, and this is a moving target as well. Uh, but because it's a high cost of energy, and as I'll show you on the next slide, um, it'll require multi-level government support until it's quite price competitive. And on the next slide, You'll see that uh, I've, uh, there are two graphs here, um, and this is measures our learning investment that would be required to support the industry until it be reaches grid parity. And the, the graph on the left is uh, the top lines coming down are the LCOE under three of the scenarios. And um, it is, over time, will become less expensive as we learn more and as we gain economies of scale and so on. And uh, the lower line that's, that's uh, curving up, <clears throat> that is an average uh, cost of uh, a blend of uh, renewable and low carbon alternative um, sources of electricity. Uh, and that would be natural gas, wind, on land wind, and uh, distributed solar. And you can see that that cost is expected to go up over time, primarily because of the cost of natural gas. Well, and at some point, uh, around 2040, uh, these lines will meet, and at that point, there will be, um, there'll be, it'll be competitive. Um, these are just based on the numbers of the day, and that gap, that that triangle, if you will, in between those two sets of lines, is really the learning investment, uh, the price premium that the government rather needs to subsidize. Um, in order to reach uh, grid parity. And, and you'll see on the right graph, the amount of that is shown in, in dollar value over that period of time. And that you can see that it, it does go up and then it starts to come back down. So in time, it'll pay for itself. Uh, these numbers also, bear in mind that when we did this study, uh, the price of oil was still close to $100. Uh, I think it was about 80 and it was dropping, and we were wondering how relevant these numbers would be. Never did we estimate that it would still be at $50 or below at this point in time. Um, so and next slide, please. <coughs> So these numbers are always a snapshot <laughs> during, uh, and we have to, we always have to adjust as we as we learn more. Um, so how is this information used? The, the studies were used by the Nova Scotia government to determine the amount of public investment in the sector, and as well to justify it to to the various uh, to taxpayers and to other stakeholders. And it allowed them to develop the policies and the, the funding and the financial support that it would provide in terms of their form, uh, the amount, the timing, uh, the duration, and, and the risk uh, that it was willing to take on. And uh, so it, that, it, that is really the purpose. These are, all, these are at the provincial level, so these are the jurisdictional level rather than project level. But this was the groundwork that needed to be done in advance of the seeing a commercial industry develop here. Uh, and, and this is important work uh, for to, before companies begin, come to break ground. Um, the studies outline the opportunity, though, as well for potential supply chain companies and give them a, gives them a bit of a, a look ahead uh, in terms of what the potential for the industry would be. 
And uh, it also informs the communities. It gives them a chance to react and to be informed about what is going on and what potentially could happen. Next slide, please. So very briefly, um, this is uh, uh, what the government's commitment was uh, as a result of the studies of the phased and progressive approach uh, toward a goal of 300 megawatts and uh, to protect the environment, respect the communities and the rights of the Indigenous peoples, uh, to have the developmental feed and tariff phase it out and then move to competitive bidding and designate an area for commercial development, which the Marine Renewable Energy Plan uh, or uh, study was done to, um, to uh, figure out what area would be suitable for development. And that's still, we're waiting to hear on that. And uh, export the surpluses if, if they happen to exist um, to the New England states. Next slide, please. So where are we then? So here we are in 2017, and at the moment there are no turbines in the water. Now there have been. Uh, there was a two megawatt device deployed in 2016. There was one uh, quite a number of years ago as well, and it was it was uh, pulled out. Many of you have probably heard the story about that turbine. But most recently, in 2016, uh, Cape Sharp Tidal uh, put in an open hydro turbine uh, in 2016, and then it was removed in 2017. Uh, I've not heard what the issues uh, are, um, heard a little bit about it, a uh, problem with the cables getting uh, tangled up, and, in, and it is out now of the water, and there's a plan to redeploy it, and add a second one, uh, which is being built right now, um, it probably, I don't know if it'll be this year or next year. Uh, then, but Cape Sharp Tidal, Tidal was uh, quick to uh, announce that they had uh, the construction had been done in Nova Scotia, and these are interesting numbers. Seventy percent of the fir first phase costs were spent in Nova Scotia, and they employed over 300 people locally, and contracts of 33 million were awarded um, to approximately 125 Nova Scotian companies. That's good industry for us. That's, a, that's good for a small province like ours. Um, other projects are delayed. Uh, there's a lot of um, merger and acquisition activity going on, as you know. So the births are changing hands. Uh, the very births that forth are changing hands. And uh, so uh, there's a lot of waiting um, uh, going on, uh, at least from our point of view. Uh, so we're not, not quite sure when the next uh, um, step will be taken. The funding advance sensor technology platform program is still going. You can see pictures of the SAS platform, and basically it uh, has sensors, uh, various types of sensors that are being tested in the fast waters in the, mi the Minas Passage, and also it's collecting data on, on fish and the movement, the movement of the water and the movement of sediment and so on. So um, that is uh, actually a very, in my view, a very successful uh, project, and our local um, companies as well as companies uh, from uh, around the globe are able to test their products in the water on the fast uh, platform and we're able to collect data about the water and the fish and the uh, other aspects of its, um, its population down there. And um, these are high value added products so the potential economic value is uh, something that we should uh, estimate or continue to focus on because it is very important for our province and for the industry. And uh, how many, uh, uh, an un another unknown is how many are employed in the industry today and, and how many have been and will be displaced and, and what's the net economic benefit to date. Next slide, please. Um, so, sorry. Uh, technical problem. Um, fishers um, are also uh, claiming that they uh, have they lost fishing grounds. They weren't consulted. That there's harm to spawning fish and lobsters, and we don't know the economic value of that. They are uh, the fishers are, are quoting the, qual the the value of the entire lobster industry in Nova Scotia, and and making it sound like it's going to 
devastate the industry, which is is not not accurate. Um, they're not saying it specifically, but it's sort of being implied that this, the whole industry, the value of the whole industry is at risk, whereas it's really just a small area of the Nova Scotia's um, lobster fishing area. And so uh, we really need to know what the lost economic value is of the particular uh, fishing grounds that would be um, lost, and, and there's still research being done about what harm it's causing to fish and lobsters. There's a lot of research going on. Um, the local indigenous, com indigenous communities, the Mi'kmaq uh, First Nation, this is their ancestral territory. They feel that uh, they're, they're concerned about uh, loss of use of the marine areas and displacement of their fishing, uh, potential impacts to the fish and fish habitat and fish migration, and um, the potential impact on marine mammals and on the water, and, and, they, and they are, they're concerned that there's a lack of meaningful inclusion of the traditional ecological studies, uh, the, the MEC studies that were done, uh, that, that there's not a meaningful inclusion of that, that information. Um, <clears throat> the uh, ro remote and rural and coastal regions, what we don't know is what benefit actually reaches the local level. Um, because the, the negative uh, impacts are some can be felt quite local, but some of the economic benefits are felt uh, across the province in our largest city, Halifax. So what benefits actually reach the local level? And of course, what is the, econ the added cost to electricity ratepayers and taxpayers? And, and, and what is the economic impact of the lost purchasing power that that additional cost or tax is um, uh, we're losing? Um, and uh, what are the opportunity cost, the opportunity cost of delays? This is something that is we rarely really can put a number on, but while we wait, uh, and fishers have uh, also lodged a. Um, um, lawsuits to try and stop uh, uh, K-Sharp titles from putting in their turbines and the delays with that and the message that's being sent out to the rest of the world regarding uh, the reaction of fishers uh, is we wonder what the opportunity cost is of that messaging and of the delays and, and of course the delays to the company, the costs are very high. So um, these are the things that we would we still need to know, and and collecting the data, uh, we can be better at it, and we can continue. We should we should go back out and and listen again to see what people's um, thoughts are now that they have actually seen a turbine on the pier and in the harbor and and going in the water and coming back out. It's much more real now, and it it, it would be worthwhile to collect people's viewpoints on that again. Okay, and so that is, uh, that's all that I have to say. Um, my next slide is just a, uh, a thank you, and, uh, and I'll hand it back over to you, Simon. Great. Thank you so much, Shelley. That was a, an excellent presentation, and, I, and a lot of good information in there from your experience that I think people can apply in their neck of the woods as well. And I just want to let people know that I am starting to get a couple of questions coming in from the audience, and as I mentioned before, we're going to go ahead and hold the questions until after Jan's presentation. So I will, I will invite you, um, now is a good time to be thinking about questions, just so we have a good discussion. And if you do send them in, um, helpful just to say whether the question is for Shelley or for Jan going forward, given that he's about to start speaking. So with that, um, again, thank you, Shelley. And our next presenter is uh, Dr. Jan Sundberg. Uh, Dr. Sundberg is a professor at the Department of Engineering Sciences, Division of Electricity at Uppsala University. Dr. Sundberg received a Ph.D. degree in evolutionary ecology from Uppsala University, uh, Sweden, in 1994. He has worked for sustainable implementation of renewable energy, attempting to raise the subject to an academic level. Acceptance issues, in particular nature conservation and environmental impact assessments, are on his agenda. So, Jan, if you're ready, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. I hope you can hear me well. Otherwise, shout out. And I will. Uh, before I'm better. Uh, first of all, uh, good morning to everybody you in the West. And as I see on the list, there's several Europeans here who I can say good afternoon to. Uh, I would like to share you some experiences of consenting V2 power, wave power projects we have in Sweden. Uh, some experiences uh, from that, and it might be 
good introduction to give you a brief reason why a gray academic end up uh, being responsible for this. Uh, but as you heard, I, I have a background from the University mainly on birds. And when I finished my PhD, it was about the same time the wind power development started off on, on a grand scale, although it's been in, in a kind of slow pace. And as the birds and the wind is an issue, I, I took an interest in that. Uh, at the same time, uh, Sweden joined the European Union, and um, we had to implement the EU directives, including the ones on EIA and the Prodigy. So I learned quite a lot of that. So I actually worked for several years in the end of, end of 90s on pre or baseline studies, post-construction studies, both at the university and at the consultancy, and, and several times together with NGOs. Uh, and in 2002, I joined the Department of Electricity, uh, Division of Electricity, where a new program started up uh, focusing on new technologies for renewable energy. And uh, coming from the terrestrial part, I had to learn the new world of marine biology, which has been a really nice trip. Anyhow, uh, I think everybody who's been working with this for some time thinks that constantly way power or a tidal is a long and tiresome process. Uh, uh, it's time consuming, and this is also true for test sites, or even projects with single units. Uh, we know all stories here in Europe where time for a consent can take uh, several years, even for single unit projects. Uh, moreover, even those small projects are heavily required extensive EIAs, which may include several years of baseline collecting data. Um, Producing IAs and especially working offshore is often really costly, and I know of some projects where, where this, including the pre- or post-contraction studies, cost, is a 5 to 10 percent cost of the total project, and that's, of course, tough for small projects. And one underlying factor why this takes time is that the, the large uncertainties among authorities and, and regulators, and, of course, there's a lot of knowledge gaps also within the science of, of of related fields. And I always thought that Sweden was a hopeless case, and uh, I'll see if you agree with me uh, when I've been doing this. So there will not be too much uh, science in this, all the science is, uh, or natural science is underlying, and very little technology. So it's more a little bit of a personal reflection of the process that I've been working with uh, with those two projects. Next slide, please. Okay, so one may ask, why do we have wave power in Sweden? Why do we have wave <laughs> in general? And of course, the first answer of that, we are looking for new sources for, for uh, tapping renewable energy. Uh, but again, Sweden is not known for being the, having the best the wave climate. But in fact, as you see on the figure, we have an open field to the North Sea uh, from the area north of Gothenburg on the Swedish West Coast. And in fact, there are some good areas also in the eastern part of the Baltic Sea, but unfortunately not on Swedish territorial uh, waters. Uh, actually, Sweden was quite early out in, in the first development of wave technologies already in the 80s. Uh, one example was called the IPS. I think it was renamed to Aquaboy, and then later sent to the Pacific coast of the U of US. And I think they had a test site of the Oregon and Washington, which was not that successful. Uh, in fact, I think this same or similar technology now is called Wave for Power, which are successfully tested uh, in, in the coast of Norway at Runde. Uh, the technology developed in Uppsala started out in early 2000s. Uh, and since mid 2000s, there are several other companies and concepts being developed here in the country. One was actually presented on a webinar in last spring. Uh, it was Minesco the Deep Green, which is now tested in, I think, Ireland. Uh, next, please. Uh, one of the first things, can I have the next slide, please? Oh, thank you. Uh, one of the first things that came up on my table was to find a test site for, for the, the, the equipment we, we developed here in Uppsala. And of course, we ended up uh, on the west coast. And we actually ended up uh, near the municipality in the town of Lusashield because the university already had a marine station there. We actually knew of some suitable areas. And basically, 
the test site, as it turned out, for the first 10 years. It was a relatively small-sized area, 40,000 square meters. There was a sea cable and the receiver station on land. Um, you can change to the next slide. And as you see on, on the map, it's CME exposed, actually only open uh, to the straight west. There are also small islands and uh, islets uh, covering it. Next slide, please. So a short, quick history. Uh, uh, 2003 and 4, I, I was actually working quite a lot down there. Uh, we were trying to find a, a good place to talk to, to uh, locals, to, uh, to the publics and, and authorities. And we actually initiated some, uh, some baseline studies, including archaeology, marine biology, and best inventory. Some of this, of course, was needed because we wanted to know where we eventually would deploy things. And we actually filed an application to the local authorities. I think this was done in early, very early 2004. And we were given a temporary consent. Uh, and we were lucky. They, the authorities uh, called this to be a min minor pro project. So we actually had this process over within three months. Uh, you can see we actually deployed the first me wave measuring buoy and had the first initial engineering test. Uh, 0405, the first generator came into the water in, in 2006. Um, by then, I already had a PhD student working on marine biological uh, issues. And by 2007, we actually managed to get uh, consent for deploying, I think it was 25 dummy buoys, because we didn't have a real park. It took several years until we had a multiple of WEX in, in the water. 2009, we had actually the first park. A park is defined more than two units. And we had a well, a special underwater substation. And 2009, uh, my first PhD also were finished uh, on her studies on biological impact. In fact, that was Livia Langhammer, who also had a, a talk here uh, uh, during the spring. Uh, we are grid connected. And what was important that we continued to have annual meetings with local communities, uh, municipalities, summer visitors, etc. And we had posters up in harbors, etc informing and even uh, telling people that take the boats, go out and have a look at them. If, you, if it's nice weather, yes, you are, you are able to pet the boys. Uh, the boys. And uh, so we had quite good communication. However, after 10 years, we were a little bit worrying what was going to happen after this. And after discussions with the local uh, authorities, uh, we realized that our project had grown out of scale, and we were actually asked to submit the full EIA with all, the, with all of this, including, and a large uh, permitting process was started. Uh, you can change the slide. Uh, the thing with that was that we could get uh, an increased area. We could have include more equipment and have more decrease of freedom within the area designated to us. OK, just a quick slide on, on what we did have or have. Uh, a surveillance tower, a lapis tower, with video surveillance, uh, small weather station, etc. What we call the dummy boys or the biology boys, which we could uh, use for studies. We have wave measuring buoy. Wave measuring buoy. Uh, for initially, we had uh, consent for 10 WEX, uh, sea cable about three kilometers long, and the generator that we are using have, or have developed is a directly driven uh, linear generator. And of course, we have a receiver station where we can do all the measurements and be connected to the grid. The bad thing about having these sort of temporary, small-scale uh, consents was that for every new item put in the water, we, we had to send in a new application. And I think it ended up to be more than 10 until 2012. Next slide, please. Uh, what was good is, was that I could uh, get support for initiating uh, my biological studies even from the start. And I'm just quickly listing some of the things we have done or are in, uh, presently doing. Studies on seabed, uh, changes in the invertebrate fauna, colonization patterns, biofouling, artificial reefs, and side effects. More speci specifically on crustacean, fish, both benthic and pelagic which, of course, if we, there's no fishing there, or restricted fishing, no, no take zone effects. Uh, one PhD was entirely looking at underwater noise. 
and we're developing new monitoring techniques techniques in order to be able to monitor around the clock, independent of weather, and so on. And what is kind of in, good for, for the PhD students is that they combine applied and basic research. They can actually do something that's good for the development of the technique, as well as testing ecological theories. Uh, and while we have the change, you can check the, the foundations of the WEX. You have cavities in it, which we uh, use to sort of increase complexity of, of the foundations. Next slide. And yes, I will not show you many, too many results, but these are kind of nice and interesting examples. What happens when you put equipment in the water? Uh, you get a lot of biofouling. On the left, you have uh, uh, barnacles, bacteria, sea squirts, I think some, sometimes a lot of other, other stuff uh, um, growing on them. We have fish schooling around them. And on the right-hand side, you can see on top left, uh, eatable crab actually using one of those holes, a sea anemone, a sea grass on the red. To the right in the middle, a cod, small cod hiding underneath the foundation, a sea star, I think a uh, great spider crab, and the lumpfish to the bottom right. And actually, this is a nice story about the lumpfish. Uh, we believe strongly that it was the same individual who lived in one of the cavities in the tops of, of the, of the wakes. So we take this as an indication that uh, the sound level or noise level wasn't too all that bad. Uh, next, please. I'll just show you a little bit about biofouling, because biofouling is now an emerging topic uh, for natural reasons. Uh, and of course, this was some of the one of the first things we, we investigated because it. We were sort of interested to see how it would sort of affect performance. Uh, we know for the largest buoys we have, which are five to six meters in diameter, diameter, we can have by the end of the summer 200 to 300 kilo wet weight uh, biofouling. And it actually turns out that we get a better absorption of waves with summer biofouling. What we do not know is, is how it will affect corrosion. Uh, to the left, you see some different kinds of buoys, which were included in a PhD project testing uh, different buoys and, and wave uh, energy absorption. Uh, to the right, you have the wave measuring buoy, which we have to take up once a year, change batteries, and clean off. And here's a typical example of brown algae, barnacles, and blue mussels colonizing the whole thing. Quite a few kilos extra heavy weight. Okay, next slide. Well, after 10 years of uh, testing in, at the Lucia test site, it was obviously we were kind of successful. We improved the technology immensely. Uh, most likely have helped uh, the commercialization of wave power on, on a greater scale. And we for sure know that the consideration on environmental impact in the marine ecological studies uh, strengthly, uh, strengthened the project considerably. Uh, by now, we have produced 25 plus PhD students, mainly on technology, but for or ongoing on, on marine ecological issues and impact. Uh, and it's kind of strange that Uppsala, we are 67, 5, 65 kilometers from the sea, and we have the largest research group in the academia in the world. We have constantly some 20, 25 students and approximately 10 senior researchers uh, working on the projects. And the shortcoming of, of a, a university pro project, we are depending on research funding, so it, there are ups and downs in sort of the economy of the project. So let's change slide and go into a commercial project. Next slide. Okay, Seabase is a spin-off company which we started up in 2001. And uh, like the work we have in the university, the company also takes sort of a holistic view, not only looking at the engineering parts from mechanics, fluid mechanics, electrical engineering, but it's more of a system solution as uh, the, the company is selling, which also, of course, includes the economy and uh, the, the environmental impact. And what's kind of nice for an environmentalist or ecologist for me 
working with engineers is that I can I'm asked for feedback on, on new te technologies and technology technological developments. So I can actually give a recommendation on what's good and what's not good. Um, anyhow, uh, let's change to the next slide. The Sultanas project, uh, which I will talk about now, uh, actually operated was uh, a project with which were intended to include 10 megawatt installed power. It will not be exactly that big, we know that. And in fact, it's a subsidiary company, Tibet Industry, who's doing the production in Lysishil. Uh The planning for the project, the Sultanet project, started out in early 2007 and were finished uh, by like late 2009. Uh, so there were quite a few years, but actually on the way we, we changed some things and we actually changed focus on area. And we received the, the permit uh, 2010. It's financed by the utility company Fortum and also by the Swedish Energy Agency. And until 2015, uh, we deployed 36 WECs. And they are now connected to the grid and test production started in 2016. And for everybody who's been working at sea, you know that the weather is one of the most important factors. And what you see to the left are actually a crane lifting uh, generators on board to the ship. And uh, we need large ships in order to deploy. And actually, the Sultanet project is on 50 meters depth. Uh, next slide, please. Well, if any of you have experience of, of wind projects, you know that uh, we shall impact is a quite hot topic. And of course, um, this has to be shown also for wave power. And this is an illustration where we actually played with 1,500 buoys at approximately 1.5 uh, kilometers distance from shore. And they're hardly visible. As you can see, there's sort of a, a yellowish line on the left-hand side. And in the beginning, we actually had local politician coming to ask, can we come out and see your project, both uh, at the university and, and here? And uh, we said, well, there's not very much to see. And, and they said, well, that's exactly what we would like to see. And that's, of course, there's a lot in hot topic about which shall impact for, for wind power. Uh, next slide, please. There is a difference of citing, of course, uh, university non-profit project versus uh, a project which supposedly should make money. And it takes much more time. And we'll just give you some examples of uh, things to consider, which is, of course include wave climate, but that's uh, something that you can actually do uh, as a desk study. But important factors are wave period and wave height, because that sort of uh, indicates energy. Of course, water depth. Is, is important, and of course, different technologies are dependent or less dependent on, on certain depths. Uh, far part is about 20 to 50 meters. It could go deeper, but it's not economically feasible yet. Uh, the construction we have up today needs uh, rather soft seabed, clay, or, or sand, and of course, the inclination should be quite low. Uh, and of course, large scale projects cannot be located too far away from the grid because you have transmission losses. And that's also one of the reasons that the first the offshore wind projects were not offshore, they were near shore, uh, because uh, too much losses and it will play back on, on your economy. Uh, next slide, please. Of course, you, you need a lot of uh, costly techniques uh, uh, when you're trying to find a good site. Uh, and sonars and echo sounders is, are very important because they're different kinds of side screens, split beam sonar, multi beam, and they all fill different kind of purposes to see what kind of uh, seabed you have, how, how constant are the layers, etc., etc. And to the top left, you see in the area in green, and this is approximately where the, the Sultanus project ended up. The total area was 0.8 square kilometers. And of course, you need also good data in order to get a cable from the site into on land. Uh, so that's the big thing to the right, the sort of snaky thing that goes all the way to the receiver station on land. Uh, more of interest, next slide please, is to sort of check all the conflicting interests. 
And these, of course, have to be investigated and in most, uh, most times also consulted with. Uh, these could be including the shipping industry or shipping lanes. And of course, these are pretty well known, but uh, have, have to be avoided. Uh, the two difficult ones, most difficult ones in our case, of course, commercial fishing and military and naval training. Uh, as it turned out, uh, there was an official training area for the, for the Navy which covered almost the Swedish, whole Swedish part of the West Coast. And that actually delayed the whole project half a year until we solved it. Uh, of course, there are already other existing infrastructure things like cable, pipelines, gas and oil from the gas and oil industry. We have quite a few remnants from the Second World War in terms of mines and dump sites for ammunition. And if you have any indication that there are shipwrecks in the area or along the, the cable track, you, are, you need to go and, and have divers go down and, and investigate. Uh, next, please. More dealing with uh, people in general uh, is when you come to, to things like recreation. The whole West Coast is a big leisure area. Most people have boats. Uh, it has a lot, a lot of culture and tradition, which has to be, uh, to be considered. And of course, uh, there's not only commercial fishing going on, there's a lot of um, leisure fishing and semi part time commercial fishing. Uh, and these all have to be considered on, on natural reasons. And then, of course, we have nature reserves. There might be seal out, uh, seal hull out uh, rocks, there might be uh, seabird colonies. Uh, on a larger scale, we have Natura 2000 Ramsar sites. And in fact, the, the university site is in a corner of a Natura 2000 site, but it's not uh, inflicting on, on the core values of, of, the, of the reserve, so it was accepted. And then again, you might, as we have, have uh, areas of national interest, there might be scenic views, et cetera, et cetera. So all this has to be, has to be considered, uh, as you might guess. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, when you have your consultations with people, they of course also want to know the advantages, uh, not only the problems. And what they like to hear is, of course, uh, it's renewable energy, it's clean energy conversion, free of free fuel, and no emissions. Low visual impact has been important, uh, as far as we know, and we know that uh, the oceans have a great energy potential. As we just heard, there are other spin-off effects like creating jobs, marine services, business, and know-how in the local communities. And this is definitely also true in the Lithuania Shield area, uh, at least at this stage. Uh, this has also been debated quite a lot in Sweden uh, in, in relation to wind, on-land wind uh, projects. And there are some really good examples of, of wind parks actually favoring smaller communities, but there are also examples of, of the opposite. And another thing which uh, is important in Sweden that it helps to fulfill several natural um, environmental goals uh, decided by the parliament. Yes, please. Next. Uh, the list you will see here, I should have translated. Oh, yes, I'm only here. Right. Uh, so these are the type of issues that comes up. Uh, uh, during uh, consultations uh, regarding environmental impact. And this is a list of sort of bi biological impact which might be, be uh, discussed. And this, most of this, of course, you, you uh, have heard of before, is magnetic fields, underwater noise, barriers, collisions, stepping stone, disturbance, habitat loss, uh, resistant organism, space need, uh, whether or not you use chemicals, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and of course, uh, I sometimes say a little provocatively that maybe not the, all these are, are true impact factors. Uh, some may or tend to be uh, invented by ac ac academics uh, having nothing else to do. But that's true. Uh, many of these will and are problems and will be problems uh, depending on scale. And of course, you should also talk about the good things. Artificial reef effects could definitely be considered good, but also have a possible negative sites. Fad, fish attracting devices, we create, in fact, new habitats. Uh, this is something that's been 
discussed quite a lot here because many marine biologists think that most of our area or the west coast is overfished. So by putting things like a wave power park in the area, we actually create no fishing or no, no take zones. And then again, this uh, related to that, we have, you can call this artificial marine reserves. And something that now is becoming a big thing in, in Europe, as it is in, part, in some projects, is to combine offshore energy projects with aquaculture and small scale fishing. Uh, and that's quite interesting. But what's also kind of nice, and uh, an X4 is a good uh, example of that, there's a big international community working on, on environmental concern. And I could actually tell us some of the results we have in Uppsala, but we'll save that to some other webinar uh, in the future. Okay, next. So now I, I'm coming to a long list. Uh, I should perhaps say I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't translate this, uh, but it's just a list on different kind of consent and permits for the, for the largest sultanus project. And although the most important one is, is the environmental court, uh, court decision number seven, uh, the environment, environmental court is the, the final decision maker giving the, the consent to the permit. And they, of course, also have material which includes the EIA and, and, and everything. But even before you start that, you have to do a lot of um, investigation uh, before you can even start you know, regarding um, rights to, to to um, uh, do investigations, uh, different kind of, of consents to do marine biological research or uh, investigation, hydrographic, bathymetrics, etc. And then, of course, many of the, the, the smaller consents uh, at the end are related to uh, grid connection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I mean, even if you've done the, the big hard part, in reaching 9.7, uh, there's quite a lot of work to be done. Uh, after that, until you can actually start up your projects. Uh, yeah, we can take the next. What most people or regulators want to know, what happens towards the end when the project has finished and, and your, your year is worn out? And in fact, there is no wave or tidal park yet in, in the world that's been really removed at a full time, a full lifetime, which might be 20, 30 years. Uh, since we uh, at the University of Test Site have tested uh, several generators which we then have removed, we do have some experience. And for instance, we know that most material can be fully recycled and reused. And we also know, although we don't have good empirical data, that the seabed actually will return to its pristine condition and we remove the stuff. And it's basically the same thing when you have a, an area which has been heavily trolled. Within 10, 15 years, uh, that area will uh, start to look like uh, an untouched area. Also, which is, has been uh, a little bit discussed, is when your installation is uh, too old, maybe you can leave the structures and, and keep them as artificial reefs, uh, something that actually has happened with some oil rigs uh, in parts of the world. Okay, let's take the next slide. So let's get back to the leadership project. What ha happened after that? Uh, actually, in 2014, in February, I started the new, the, started the EIA process and getting a new application ready. Uh, actually, most of the baseline data we had already in place due to many years of study. But there was quite a lot of uh, consultation works, uh, which took about half a year. And we filed an application in December 2014. It was actually the 22nd of December. On the 23rd, I left on a three-week vacation. Uh, anyhow, half a year later, a uh, little bit more, we received a 20-year permit, which uh, uh, actually granted us some um, more freedom. Uh, if you see the big area in black, that was actually the whole area we took up for discussion during consultations. The small uh, quadrat in the, in the right with, with all the dots in it, that was the, the original site. And actually what, what we ended up with after talking to locals especially and, and people with boats was that the, the, the red rectangle was the, actually the area we have 
uh, consent for in its approximately half square kilometer. And what's actually happened as we speak, there is a discussion of, of using this area as a national test site. It's called this project called Test Site Skadrak, uh, which would actually enable outside actors to come and test uh, equipment, and perhaps other technologies, etc. cetera. Um, and the good thing for the university is that we can get financial help and we can have a better infrastructure, etc. Okay, we can uh, go on to the next slide. We're coming towards the end. Uh, I just wanted to give you some idea of my feelings of the different kinds of organizations and, and agencies we have in uh, consulting, uh, having meetings, and, and uh, uh, so, so forth. Uh, the regional authority, which sort of is handling the, the, most of the, the process, is, should be uh, neutral. Actually, they were quite positive uh, when we wanted to expand the area for the university project because they would not have to give, then they wouldn't have to give consent for test sites other, uh, other places. Of course, the, the small towns, Lysishiv and Urus were quite positive. The energy agency was positive to the uh, large-scale project because they were financing it, but they gave no response for the university project. The armed forces, uh, of course, were negative in the beginning, became neutral and gave us okay. Uh, the Swedish fishermen organization were very negative. However, um, we came to an agreement, and they actually also complained about the small test site, even though they were not fishing in there. Um, but anyhow, we had pretty good uh, communication with them. Uh, Coast Guard, quite good and helpful sometimes. Uh, Swedish Agent for Marine and Water Management, which was one of the more important agencies. They had requirements which uh, consider, uh, concerned the, the uh, post construction uh, programs and monitoring. Uh, National, uh, uh, protection, uh, National Protection Agency actually had no replies on any of them. The Regional Archaeological Museum had requirements on, on uh, surveys for, uh, for wrecks. Local community generally very positive. Now we get back to that a little bit later. And sports fishermen really positive. And we have actually some uh, part-time fishermen uh, nearby the university test site who are very positive because they claim they get much better catches of the eatable crabs these days. Two important agencies is the Transport Agency and the Swedish Maritime Administration because uh, they are the ones setting the rules in, in many instances. They require the risk, risk assessments, how to market the buoys, how to mark out the, the park, and also to have a good contingency plan. And a little bit depending on who you're talking with up there, they can be negative, they can be neutral, and they can even be positive. And one good thing is that we actually have good connections with the largest uh, marine, uh, marine biology and oceanic research center in the area, which is the Sven Lewin Center, which belongs to Gothenburg University, which are very positive and also a future participant in the uh, future project. I said prevent fishing. Uh, this is a little bit to show that getting some things done is not always uh, uh, that easy. I have for about eight or ten years tried to get a f uh, prevent fishing within the university test site area, and there's no authority who, who actually can act on that issue, which means we end up uh, having uh, uh, cages and even nets to be found within the, the test site area, and which, of course, disturbs our, our studies as well. Okay, we're about to reach the end. Um, I will sum up a little bit. So next slide, please. So what have we learned or what have I learned? Uh, I think it was in Scotland that the term one-stop shop was uh, invented or introduced because they thought that the, this whole consenting process was too complicated with too many authorities involved. So they actually have one authority who is chief responsible. We have this fiddler, in, in a sense. We have the, the uh, regional governments or, or authorities. But as you saw on the list before, the, it's not quite uh, that good. So it could definitely be improved. And actually, some of these other ones, they also uh, require EIAs to be uh, filed. Uh, for my years, uh, both at the literature test site and with work of the larger place, 
website. Uh, one of the most important things I've learned is inform, inform, share, and consult. Uh, build trust with people, and we need to talk to local people uh, year after year. You have to do that. And also, if you have good persons in different authorities which you constantly can come back to, uh, it's very good uh, in many aspects. Uh, we have to be frank about that knowledge is poor, but sometimes also common sense and best knowledge may guide you quite well, and especially you can find support for you for your, or in your arguments. Uh, one important thing, especially with locals uh, and the people in the, in the near sphere, is to share information results. People are curious, and they're actually sometimes proud that they have a project, at least that's what we have found. Uh, that they have a project uh, uh, next door. And one thing of doing it is you see the graph up to the uh, upper side of the slide. It's actually the, the wave measuring buoy we have, which we have available on the internet. So it's actually real time data. So uh, people really like to see can we go fishing today or will we travel some? And so that's just something we can actually give for, for free. And of course, also show benefits and possibilities with the project. And even more important, be upfront because we don't know, we don't have all the answers, and we should be frank about positive or possible negative impact. Another thing is, yes, be flexible. Um, this could include uh, the choice of site, but it also could be other issues like times. It, uh, you can't consult with, some, with one group of people uh, at one part of the, uh, one specific parts of the year with you can with others. Uh, taking this to a little bit broader scale, I mean, we, in WAVE we have quite a number of different kind of technologies, and this is partly also true in, in title. And of course, issues and questions may differ. Uh, it's quite clear from my experience that legislation and regulation differ between countries, even within the UE, especially practice, uh, how it works out. And I guess it's the same between states in the US. And of course, as you know, legislation for on-land installation differs from offshore installation. And actually, what people care about differs between parts of the world and even parts in, uh, in a country. And uh, so this is uh, some things one, one can consider. And I would just like to end with the next slide. Uh, I was participating in an EU project some years ago. Uh, which was ongoing for four, almost four years. It was called SOFIA, and I think it represented 10 partners from seven countries, all who had been working with small scale or, or test sites for wave farms. Uh, it resulted in 13 reports, six conference papers, and three journal publications. There was, until recently, a uh, EU site for this. Uh, it was Deborah Grease at Plymouth University who was responsible for this. Uh, and she is working hard to find a, a site and uh, bring up a site uh, from Plymouth University to make these reports and papers uh, accessible. Uh, also, I think today you can find some of them on the Internet and ResearchGate. And of course, Annex 4 and US is doing a great work uh, in a similar direction. So by that, I can have my last slide. And by that, uh, I would like to thank you for sitting in uh, with those Swedish stamps. Uh, I know there will be time for some questions, but you feel free to <coughs> email me and ask questions or ask uh, any time you like. So that is, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Jan. Um, Marvin, would you mind switching to the, not the next slide, well, the final slide. We're going to do some Q&A here. But I also wanted to have this slide up on the screen. For those of you who aren't familiar with TPIS or Annex 4, I invite you, there's uh, web links there to follow to go explore more on your own. And I'll say a few words after our Q&A. And for those of you who have a question that you want to ask either Shelley or Jan, please do um, submit that question uh, as, as Marvin instructed at the beginning of the webinar. We have a couple that have come in. And I'll start with one for Shelley. So Shelley, are you there? The question was, um, 
What is the methodology to quantify the adverse impacts on displaced industries? Uh, yeah, the, um, I think basically we would go about it uh, like you would an economic impact analysis, input-output analysis. The first thing, it, it's basically what's the loss of business uh, in, to another industry. And uh, a consultation would be first. You'd have to go and, and talk with people and find out what displacement might occur and, and what is the value of the business um, that w what is what business would be lost. Uh, for instance, fishers might say, uh, you know, that's a part of our fishing grounds, and we've been fishing there for years, and we won't be able to fish there anymore. Uh, or you, uh, and you would have to find an. Um, Give an estimate of the, the catch, for instance, uh, would it be 3% uh, of their catch or 5 or 3% of the province's catch? Uh, and then simply apply a, an economic value on that using standard input output analysis and, uh, that gives you estimates of gross domestic product and jobs and uh, direct and indirect jobs and so on. Other areas that there might be displacement might be tourism. So if there are tourists, Tourist oper tourism operators, for instance, that take people out onto the Bay of Fundy to to do whale watching or what have you. Uh, um, typically, this is not where the fastest waters are. It wouldn't be very safe. Uh, commercial shipping might have to be diverted. You would be able to estimate the extra cost uh, to that uh, in terms of time. But again, these are really fast. This is fast water, and, and it's not an area where there's much uh, commercial shipping. Um, there's also some on-land issues. I mean, cables and equipment have to be on land. Is that is that imposing on anyone else's uh, work? And and that to be able to estimate that would be what work would be lost, and and then the economic impact of that. Great, thank you, Shelley. So, a uh, question for Jan. Um, John, you, you spoke a bit about uh, local communities and, and working to build trust. What were some of the factors that led to acceptance by the local community? And how much was the perception of environmental impact or risk a factor in influencing acceptance? Uh, I think in general people are very positive towards renewable energy. Uh, it's obvious that, that in some parts of the world, I mean, people question things uh, in a different way. So, I mean, <clears throat> that, of course, is a plus. Uh, but as I said, uh, people are curious and sometimes proud of having a project like this in just next doors. Uh, <clears throat> of course, there are always naysayers or saying, what is this worth? Uh, <clears throat> but it's like going into the classroom and there's always students sleeping somewhere. <laughs> uh, but really, I think it's a way of tackle, tackle people. Uh, I mean, sometimes you have to talk to the fishermen as, as fishermen speak, and you have to talk to the farmers uh, as, the way as they speak, or the engineers the way they understand. So it's 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 actually quite a lot for the the ones leading consulting or consulting discussions that they have to have uh, be flexible and, and listen in uh, to it. Um, but then again, also, I mean, be, be, be there for them. If, you, if they ask questions, make sure that they get their answers. And if you don't have them, send it to them later. Um, and of course, you don't have all the answers. And as I also said, they only share the information, update them continuously. I, I think that helps quite, quite a lot. But yes, it's definitely, a, as, as far as I understand, big big difference between where in the world you do this depending on, on culture or things or, or whatever. So I don't have a good, good answer. I'm not in, into social science, really. I'm a national scientist. But, uh, yeah, I, that's a quick and dirty answer. Great. Thank you. Um, question for Shelley. Uh, you noted that fishermen got to see uh, a turbine deployed and decommissioned at force. What specific interactions did fishermen have with the turbine and were there any specific outreach efforts around that those set of interactions? Uh, they did. 
did. Uh, so the turbine was retrieved. I wouldn't say decommissioned. It was just retrieved to take for, out for repair. Um, <clears throat> so when the device was deployed the first time, pretty well uh, people were aware it was happening. Um, they were able to track the barge uh, online and see that it was moving toward the site. And it was on site for quite some time. And then finding the appropriate time to put it down, of course, you need to slack time, it tied, and it has to be during the neap tide. Uh, and it, so it was, it was well, people were well aware of it, go, of it going, when it was going to go in. Fishers were there. They, there, were, there were fishing boats around, and many people on shore, people were able to watch the, the process from on shore. Um, so, and then when it, uh, when it came out, um, likewise, they were uh, they were aware that it was coming out. I'm not too sure about the retrieval of it exactly. How much involvement there was of fishers uh, around the uh, retrie retrieval process, because that was done a little bit more quietly. There was discussion about moving it to another spot um, so they could continue to have it operate. And fishers objected to that and saying, you know, there was no study done in that other area, and we don't know what the fish, the fish that are there, and, and so on. And we weren't consulted about that, and so they they managed to stop. Um, well, or a decision was made later to not put it somewhere else, but rather to take it up and and take it to um, to uh, to do to the dock. And um, the fishers on on the whole were 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 around to observe and around to make sure that their uh, concerns were. Make sure that people knew that they were they were concerned and that they were uh, objecting in 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 some respects. Um, and the interactions have been um, not always pleasant. Um, there, there's uh, you know people were consulted and lots of opportunity for fishers to participate, but. Um, it seems once you, the, the reality of it sets in uh, when you see this large piece of equipment um, ready to go into the water, it just changes your perspective somehow. And and so fishers were were very concerned, um, and or at least are indicating their concern um, for for a, a, a plethora of reasons, I think. Um, and uh, I'm starting to lose track of the, the initial question. Was I know were they there and did they were they uh, did they participate in it? Can can you give me uh, the rest of the question? Yeah, I mean that that, that was just um, were there any specific outreach efforts around? You know, you have this turbine in, in the water being pulled out of the water, and did you use that as an opportunity for outreach? Um, it was not me, uh, but so when the, the, uh, the fishers asked to delay it, the fishers wanted to were protesting that not enough data was collected on the fish moving through that area, and uh, they uh, the, so Cape Sharp Tidal um, said, okay, we're going to delay our deployment so that we can consult with the fishers again and on point, and so they did, and they and they did quite a bit of consultation with the fishers uh, who were expressing concern. With regard to deployment or re retrieval, it was taken out a little bit more quietly, um, and I think the fishers were pretty happy to see it uh, pulled out. Uh, the plan is to redeploy it, and uh, as far as I know, and um, um, so. But the um, they tried the fishers tried to have the courts uh, stop the deployment because there was not a lot of uh, pre-study done, and the courts looked at what was done and said. No, they're doing everything possible, and and so carry on. Um, so and, and and so they did. Cape Shark put their turbine down. Great, thank you for that. So we are we're nearing the end of our time. <clears throat> I have one more question for for Jan before I wrap it up. If anybody else has any questions, now is the time to to go ahead and send them our way. Um, but I'll ask Jan this question here. You talked a little bit about uh, Sophia and Annex 4 as you know good good data sharing or, or information sharing activities, but getting more specific, did you have any experience with transferring uh, specific data sets or um, 
or information between what you learned uh, through testing with the university site to the commercial deployment uh, opportunities that you discussed? Did you actually have opportunities to use information or data from one site to the next? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, I actually forgot to mention that. I mean, uh, working for an, with a university project gives some kind of, of uh, uh, I mean, it, it's uh, people trust universities. And also, I mean, since we publish papers uh, in, in, in international journals, uh, gives a good reputation. We also have reports uh, locally or naturally. Uh, and, of course, we could use quite a few of the data, so we at least we were on our way to get some data so we can give indicative answers. And I think another thing which also has helped is that, I mean, uh, we have actually been upfront with that we also want to solve these uh, questions or, or get answers to these questions. Uh, so either we, we promoted that we, we, we will, like in the university, we have a number of things that we'd like to look into in the future. Uh, and also, actually, I'm, I'm actually doing some of the work for the commercial side, the pre-construction uh, uh, studies via the university, although we are, for some questions we actually hire in uh, consultancy firms. Uh, so, yes, uh, and also, I mean, that, that's also good for, for the general public, um, that they can actually get information and we can say you can go and read it here and there. Unfortunately, we don't have a good uh, web page for this, but... Uh, uh, definitely. Um, so, having had the, the university project already for for five six years, when the commercial project started, that was also crucial for the ease, the relative ease we, we had with the commercial project. And I also forgot to say that that yes, on a, on a national uh, comparison, I think we are pretty well off in, in Sweden in terms of, of how to get consent. Uh, authorities and regulators are kind of pragmatic, and they actually most of the time. Uh, well-educated persons, and of course they also know that we don't have all the answers yet, but then we, we are required to, to get answers for them. Excellent. Thank you for that. So I would like to thank both of our speakers today, uh, Dr. Shelly McDougall and Dr. Jan Sundberg. Very uh, excellent presentations. I, I'm not getting any more questions, but I have seen a couple of notes come through thanking you both for um, good information and, and um, very helpful presentations today. And I just wanted to mention again that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the link you see there on your screen at, on TFIS. So I, I, I understand that maybe there have been some audio difficulties for this presentation. If you are having those difficulties, uh, please do visit and, and watch the recording. That could help. Um, and also watch, watch for announcements in general on TFIS and Annex 4. And if you'd like to be on our webinar mailing list, you can also see the link there. And finally, I just wanted to thank our, our team. Dr. Andrea Topping, who leads this effort, is on travel uh, this week, which is why I'm being your moderator today. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm Simon Gearloff. And of course, we have Jonathan Whiting and Michaela Freeman, who have been in the background today working on the webinar, as well as Amy Woodbury. So thank you to the TPS team. And Thank you to all of you, and we hope to see you next time on webinar number 15. Marvin, if, if there's any final remarks, please take us home. Thanks for joining today's conference. The session is now concluded, and you may disconnect.